So I if you were here yesterday and you uh, have a functioning nervous system, uh, you'll know that there was someone called John Snow, and he, uh, he, he didn't take, but he got other people to take the handle off the pump. And even though the epidemic was almost over, uh, it's hugely symbolic for us in public health. We just love it. He's become one of our heroes. And he's one of our heroes, I think, because he saw a problem, he saw a solution, and then he took action. And we just, and we just love him for that, um, that he took action. Our heroes are really important to us in public health. Uh, we've got Geoffrey Rose. We heard yesterday, actually, that he danced with Margaret Thatcher. But we still love him. <laughs> if he'd have slept with it, that would have been different. <laughs> so we love Jon Snow because he took action. Now, what would have happened today? I think, I think we would have done something different. I think we would have written a paper about the burden of cholera in London, and we would have called for more funding for research on cholera because I think that's the kind of game that public health is increasingly getting into. And that's what worries me. And this, I think, has, set, is, has the potential to set public health back. This is, this is an estimate of the global burden of disease uh, in, the, in the world. And basically, what we do is we have a top of the pops of diseases. And, uh, and you hope your diseases close to the top, because if your disease is close to the top of top of the pops, you become a pop star. I mean, it's, it's as clear as that. But I th I'm sceptical about this, because I think what we've got to do, we shouldn't be talk, we shouldn't bang the drum for problems, we should bang the drum for solutions. And we should work together on, you know, are the, if there are solutions that are highly effective and highly cost-effective, we just must make sure that people in the world get them. Because I, I don't want to be a pop star, because this is, this is what we've got in public health at the moment. I think what happens is you, you, have, you have somebody, usually a, a white man actually, and they say, I represent all of you people with this disease. And... Um, and they go on, and they travel business class, and they get the fluffy towels, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it's so easy to feel like you're a pop star. You're a pop star because you're representing lots of people with a disease. But I think we should be, we should be advocating for solutions, and not for problems. Um, you see, because um, if you're a pop star for one... You see, I don't want... I, I, I've worked in injury, but I don't want to be a pop star for injury because I care about mental health as well. I remember having a black dog in my life once. I'm, I'm a doctor, so I prescribed myself Prozac, and it was fantastic. I did some of the best conferences ever on Prozac. Um, I had to stop it in the end because it has this really nasty side effect. You become completely irresistible to women. You, I think misery is so prevalent that if, you, if, if, if people see happiness, they, they just come and start talking to you. I just, I couldn't cope with that anymore and I, ha I had to stop it. So, so I don't want to be a pop star for any particular disease. I would rather work with colleagues collectively and advocate solutions, whatever, whatever problem they may, may be about. So... And the taxonomy of solutions isn't the same as the taxonomy of interventions. So th we were talking yesterday, I put this in last night because we were talking about mode of communication. This is one, uh, one trial, that, uh, an invention of, of someone called Am Anthony Rogers from New Zealand, uh, text-based smoking cessation support. Uh, Carrie Free and Rosemary Knight trialed at the London School of Hygiene Clinical Trials Unit. Fantastic, it doubles biochemically validated smoking cessation. It's not cost effect, it's not only cost effective, it's cost saving, so that we're stupid not to do it. It's, it's the most carbon, at least carbon intensive of all, of all the smoking cessation initiatives. This is great. We must really do this. And then, I've been working on this problem, injury, for a long time. I've got some of my heroes here. Ian Chalmers taught us about systematic reviews, and Richard talk, taught us about 
taught us how, why we should do big trials. Halima Shakur sh showed me how to, how to actually do big trials. And so we've been, the first big trial we did, uh, corticosteroids in head injury, increased the risk of death by 10%. They've been widely used all around the world. I felt I was Harold Shipman of, of uh, trauma care research for a while. Um, and then we started working on this one. That man on the floor will be bleeding. When you bleed, you start to form a blood clot. That's that, that uh, yellow stuff. Uh, there's an enzyme in the blood that goes along, and it's like a scissors, and it chops, chops, chops. It chops up the blood clot, and the blood gets thin, and it falls out more, and you're more likely to die. And then there's this. Um, about the year I was born, this woman here and her husband, um, Utako Okamoto, uh, she invented a drug that inhibits this enzyme that chops up blood clots, and it's called tranexamic acid. It's widely used around the world in the treatment of heavy menstrual periods. Uh, we did a systematic review of randomized control trials of the use of this drug in surgery. Dramatic reduction in the risk of needing a blood transfusion, so it really stops you bleeding. So this is a treatment that stops people bleeding, we looked, we did a systematic review of randomized controlled trials of this treatment in trauma, and there'd never been a single trial. So we, we wanted to do the sorts of trials that Richard taught us to do. So we did. We did another trial called CRASH-2 trial. We randomly allocated 20,000 bleeding trauma patients to get either tranexamic acid or matching placebo, and we just got a beautiful result. I was so over... I'm still... When I cycle home now... I, I still get little frissons of excitement. This is two and a half years later. I, I'm, I'm 50 and I've been doing clinical trials for 20 years. I've never found anything that's been effective before. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm just really, really happy uh, about this. So it's a treatment that really seems to work. It seems to work everywhere. Of course, you know, you don't... This is a subgroup analysis by... Uh, country, you don't compare this with this, you compare this, this, and this with this, and you know, it works everywhere, and it's, and it's fantastic. So, um, it doesn't seem to have any side effects. This, it, we estimated how many lives around the world could be saved if everybody got this. This isn't estimating the global burden of disease, it's estimating the global benefit of solution. And it's something like 120,000 lives, you know, with the most conservative asso uh, assumptions. 120,000 lives every year. So that's really good. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's really cost-effective. Uh, th these are some diseases that are really prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Insecticide-treated bed net. You know, all of these interventions are really quite cost-effective. But some are more cost-effective than others. And... You know, I would like, I would like to, be, to advocate for tranexamic acid in trauma patients because it really works. But I'd also want to say, well, look, if you haven't got enough money to do that, then for goodness sake, do insecticide-treated bed nets because you get more value for money. Um, and I don't see why we can't. So I don't see why, as a school of public health, we can't all get together, decide what are the most cost-effective interventions and advocate for them collectively, so that we all work together. So wherever I go, I don't say tranexamic acid for trauma because I care about black dogs, mental health, um, uh, HIV, malaria. We should, why can't we care about them all? When I was a doctor, I wouldn't get a patient and say, um, well, you know, they, they, they come into the intensive care unit seriously ill. Uh, I say, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a meningitis doctor. I, you know, I, we just, we don't care ab about the labels that we give for people suffering. Because we, diseases, we've got to remember, are just labels. This is a table. You can say what it is. But you can have one in the room, but you can't have a diabetes in the room. You know, diabetes is a concept. It, it's, it's, it's a label invented by doctors. In this case, it's invented to refer to people who've got a fasting glu blood glucose greater than 6.9. You can't have a depression in the room. You can have a case of depression. But what a case of depression is, is defined by you. So these metrics of how much burden of this and that and the other is, it's, it tells us more about our labeling conventions than, than anything really useful about human suffering, I believe. And I know it's just me and Jon Snow who believe this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in, in a minority, I, I, I will admit to that. So, we got really interested 
in how to get this treatment into practice. It, it really mattered for me personally. Uh, I remember I killed a little girl once, a 13-year-old girl. She came into the emergency department bleeding. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. I, she was fully conscious. I was, I was uh, holding her head, talking to her. She said, is everything going to be all right? I said, everything's going to be perfectly all right. She went into surgery and she bled to death. And I just felt I killed her. Uh, I just uh, took away her consciousness when we put her to sleep for, for, for surgery. And uh, she never woke up, and I just, I just felt awful about it. And so now we've found a treatment that works. I really want to make sure it happens in the world, uh, but not at the expense of other important problems. So... It's a fact of war. Many injuries suffered on the battlefield result in severe bleeding. Stopping it is key to saving lives. So the discovery that an old drug can perform new tricks is great news for military personnel. There was a recent trial carried out by the London School of Hygiene of uh, Tropical Medicine, um, which was sponsored by NIHR called Crash Tube Trial. And it looked at the introduction of something called tranexamic acid, which stops clocks breaking down. Within weeks of that trial delivering its results, we now use that as part of our treatment process. <coughs> So that was, the real, that was the first thing that happened. So we got the result, you know, published in The Lancet. No, usually, the publication in The Lancet is necessary for, but sufficient for nothing. Uh, you know, it doesn't make anything. There's lots and lots. And you, know, the, you have a press release, and then it moves on. And so the best thing that happened was that that man, uh, who's the Surgeon General, put it in military medical protocols. That was fantastic. Um, so he put it in mid military medical... So British soldiers in Afghanistan who were shot or blown up were treated with tranexamic acid. That was great. That was a big breakthrough. Uh, but the Americans were sceptical. Of course, they have this unique physiology, unique, different hemoglobin. <laughs> hemoglobin of Barmacus, it doesn't respond in the same way. So they were very sceptical, and so they did their own study in... Um, well, what, what we had a situation in, in Afghanistan where, we had, where, where they had um, uh, soldiers coming in treated by British military doctors, they got tranexamic acid. So, soldiers coming in treated by American military doctors, they didn't get tranexamic acid. And they decided to do a cohort study. Fortunately, the, the, the ones treated who got tranexamic acid were much more severely injured uh, than those who didn't, uh, than, than the other lot. Um, but um, they were much more likely to survive. So I, had to, I, had to, I remember being invited to this meeting in Washington to present the results of, of the CRASH-2 trial. And, um, and so I, beforehand I went to... Uh, because relative risks is a really tricky concept for, a, for a, an American soldier trauma surgeon. That's a, really, that's a big one. It's a big ask. So I went to uh, Arlington Cemetery. This is... Plot, plot 69, it's where people go where they've been uh, killed in uh, uh, Afghanistan or Iraq. And uh, it just so happened there, there was this hillside where there was just 100 graves. And so I could show them that you know, a, a, a third reduction in the risk of bleeding to death would mean the graveyard would look like that. So that's, that's how I tried to get over relative risks to um, American trauma surgeons. And I, it, it, was, it was really strange because there was this... There was this military general, and he stood up, and, uh, you know, he was... What struck me about him, he was just so hairy. <laughs> he, he, he was wearing a shirt and tie, and then he had all this, like, fluff, fuzz coming out. He was dripping in testosterone. And, and he said, he said, uh, and he said you, know, you know, we don't... We're sceptical about these results, Dr. Roberts. And I, I got up to object, and he said, Ian, sit down. <laughs> And I realized, my God, this is just animal biology. I must, I must confront the alpha male. So, so, so I just stood for the, for, for the rest of his session. But anyway. So the, this, though, the Ameri there's, a, there's a guy called Mark, Wid Mark Midwinter, who's a, who's a British uh, trauma doctor in the, in the army. Very, very clever. Cl much cleverer than me on the diplomacy side. He realized he worked with the army, he did this cohort study, he showed there were uh, the f much fewer deaths in, th in the group that got tranexamic acid, so they started, to, so they put it in their military medical protocols as well. Now, the, 
there's not a lot of evidence about what works about getting things into practice. So, uh, we, you know, we've done a systematic search for the randomized evidence. But, you know, there's not a lot of work. But we decided to study the pharmaceutical industry because the pharmaceutical industry are very clever. Um, they're very good at getting doctors to do things. And so there is this treatment called Activated Factor 7A, um, which is, has been shown in randomized controlled trials to have no effect on mortality with a highly in statistically significant increase in serious adverse events like amputation, stroke, myocardial infarction. But the doctors love it. Um, and they love it because um, they, the pharmaceutical companies are so good at... Uh, promoting stuff, and they're very clever. The first thing, actually, the, the first thing that got this going is a, is a case study in The Lancet. So this was one Israeli soldier, um, and, and it's fantastic. A 19-year-old soldier was admitted with a high-velocity rifle injury. The bu bullet tore through the inferior vena cava at L5, causing extensive damage. He was admitted in a critical condition with profound shock. In a desperate attempt to control the bleeding, he got this new drug, and he, and he survived. And this story just went all around the world. And, they lo and everybody loves it. It's not true. Well, it, it's true in this case. He, you know, he survived, but he didn't survive because of the activated factor 7A, because the randomized control trials show the opposite. So, um, but this, if you can get persuasive human stories, emotional narratives, and combine them with results that you know to be true from randomized control trials, then you can really do, do something. So, you know, we, we did a sort of review of the stories of this. Most of the literature on this drug are just stories. We are, humans are biologically prone, programmed for narrative. It's really misleading, it's really a problem, but that's what we love. Um, Oh, no, let's, let me just tell you what this is. Um, so this is a, uh, they're so clever, they manage to product place in um, soaps. So this is a scene from uh, a casualty drama. I think it was Holby City in the UK. Let me just... I know you don't agree with what I'm doing. I just think they should have taken better care of you. They did. That drug almost killed you. No. It saved my life. When I was shot, lying there on that road, I was so scared that I would die. And then they came. They risked their lives to get me. They gave me factor 7A. <laughs> and it stopped the bleeding. I can't sue them for that. Okay. <laughs> The last thing she says is, I can't sue them for that. Well, she can sue them for that. <laughs> so anyway, we, um, so we had about the summer after we got the results. Um, I was in, in um, North Wales on holiday. I'm, my, my brother lives there. And, and I, his son is, a, is a, a student of animation in Bristol University. And I was talking. I said, look, what we really need is some sort of emotional, simple thing that will hopefully spread. And so he went up to his bedroom, and then he came down three months later, and <laughs> he invented this. Systolic 100. Systolic 90. Get me blood. Tranexamic acid, given within three hours of injury, reduces the risk of bleeding to death by 30%. It works. Use it. <sighs> so he came up with that. Uh, Richard Horton helped us by publishing it in The Lancet. It was uh, featured in the uh, New York Times. Uh, within the first week, it had had 10,000 hits. And then someone told me I had to take it down, otherwise I can go to jail, uh, because I was advertising drugs to the public. And um, I didn't want to go to jail. Uh, so, so, so we took it down. And that, well, actually, we put it on the, it's still on the Lancet's website, so it's all right there. You don't have to go to jail if you advertise to other doctors. Um, <laughs> then um, 
normally when you uh, do a clinical trial, you, well, you know, this was uh, funded by the NIHR, and they, they make these monographs, and they're just, uh, they're just completely unreadable. They're just really long. I, I mean, it's important that they exist, because it's important to have a sort of documentary ev evidence of one. So instead, we, we, made, a, we made a cartoon, uh, and so we distributed this uh, short, like, manga, basically, uh, that just <laughs> takes a few minutes to read. It. And uh, it's, it's been really successful. I know it's been successful because we've had lots of complaints um, about it. We put, um, we put a little bit of uh, uh, lewd behaviour in it. Uh, this, this is a, a female intensive care doctor uh, who's slapping another one on the bum. And, um, and, and two, intensive, two, two trauma doctors from, uh, from South Africa wrote to me and they said, you know, in this area of human rights, slapping a colleague on the bottom, uh, in public or otherwise, is completely unprofessional and, and could result in a charge of sexual harassment. So we were delighted about that, because unless, unless you really annoy someone, you, know, you might not be alive. And, and so the, the more people that you could, if you, unless you annoy people, you're not doing anything, I think, really. But the real, the real power of these big trials that, that we learned how to do from, uh, from CTU, CTU in Oxford is that you've just got all of these people. We had 400 hospitals in 40 countries. We've just got all of these people who have a stake in the results. So this is the Colombian National Coordinator to, to, you know, disseminating the results in Colombia. We've got people disseminating the results. It's just fantastic. You just built into them, you just have an army of people who just want to make it happen, and it, it, it's really good. Uh, so we've had some successes, it's been put on the, you know, it's incorporated into the WHO list of essential medicines, the armies are using it, uh, you know, in, in the UK it's going on to, into trauma guidelines, um, trauma guidelines in the UK, but most of the world, most of that 100, 130,000 lives that we could prevent with, could save with this highly cost-effective treatment will not be uh, be saved. It will take a long, long time. And so, you know, we've just, I, I feel we've got, I want to find a way to carry on working on this that's not competing uh, with colleagues for a share of voice. Because I, I think if, uh, that this competing thing really doesn't makes sense. We've got um, some uh, interventions, this is one that uh, Peter's, Peter Pierce really helped us with. Um, we, we've, uh, it's called the Trauma Promise Initiative. We're trying to use that sort of normative business that we heard about yesterday to, um, you know, this is like, uh, we, we ask hospitals to sign up to a pledge to assess the evidence on tranexamic acid, make sure it's available in their hospital and to use it. About 150 hospitals have signed up to this pledge. We hope it will carry on spreading, but we, but we just have to keep, keep moving it along. Um, this is uh, Utako Okamoto. She's the woman I showed you in the picture uh, who identified this drug. She, she identified this drug uh, in her early 30s. Uh, she, she published the results uh, showing that it was you know, effective the year I was born. And here she is, she's, she's, uh, she's 96. And uh, it was just so exciting to be able to go up to her and tell her about this. And, and uh, we presented her with a certificate. And, and her story, one of the other things we learned yesterday is about the importance of stories and how we've created the narrative of Jon Snow to tell a story. So I, I, I want to... It's a real, no, it's not, it's not that we're creating the narrative, it's almost like you're lifting it out of the past. I want to try and lift this woman out of the past because she's really incredible. Uh, for example, she told me that, um, uh, you know, uh, she, there was no childcare, her, her, her daughter was in that picture because uh, there was nowhere else to put her when she was doing her work. She, she did work on laboratory animals, that's not unusual, but she ate her laboratory animals afterwards because the, Japan was a really poor country in those days and there wasn't enough. Uh, wasn't enough food to go around, so uh, she, she did experiments on dogs, and then she ate the dogs afterwards. And uh, this is mixed. I, I met a trauma surgeon the other day who said, you know, "Oh, Ian, what's the name of that drug? You know, invented by the bird who, Japanese bird who ate her dog." Um, <laughs> so they, 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 you know, they re remember some of it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 
We've we got to work on that one. Um, this is the problem that she really wanted tackled. When she invented the drug, she, she envisaged it would be used for women with postpartum hemorrhage. About 100,000 women die each year of postpartum hemorrhage around the world. Uh, it, it, it hasn't been trialled. For, it hadn't been trialled for postpartum hemorrhage, but now we're doing a trial called the Woman Trial, aiming to randomise 15,000 women uh, to get tranexamic acid or not. 6,000, 6,500 randomised so far. Also doing a sick trial in gastrointestinal bleeding. My big brother died of a gastrointestinal bleed two years ago. He didn't get tranexamic acid. It's a really cheap drug. Uh, so well, I hope it'll be an effective treatment for that. Um, uh, now this... This is, um, you see, I think we've got to find a way to work together to promote highly cost-effective interventions because I've, I've, I'm really convinced that resources are limited. Um, you know, I, I think you know, we should, we should I know, sort out arms sales and we should take money from bankers, but eventually, you know, resources are limited. The places I go, uh, I see limited resources everywhere. And so this is a hospital I went to in, uh, in uh, Ibadan, Nigeria. It's Ade, Adeoyo Hospital. And um, they, were, they were randomizing into the, into the woman trial, and then they stopped, and we went to find out why. And, well, we were going there for other reasons. But we, we went to this hospital, and the hospital was closed. So the, it was a maternity hospital in Ibadan, Nigeria, and it was closed. And it was closed because they ran out of money. And so... Um, if uh, you know, if, if a woman had a, you know, if, if, if an obstetric emergency, she, she would just die. Um, but there was one part of this hospital that was that was open, and uh, it, it's just down back behind those cars, and, and it was a, a little part of the hospital that you could only get in. There was a there was a guard with a gun at the door and a metal door, and they'd open you. You could get in if you were pregnant and HIV positive and then you'd get nevirapine, and that's a good thing. But it just didn't seem right to me that we have got that, and the rest of the hospital's closed. Uh, so I, I feel we've got to find a way to work together to promote cost-effective interventions, because all of the women who lived in this community, big, big, big community, big, big city in, in, in Nigeria, you know, if they had obstructive labor, they would die. If they had postpartum hemorrhage, they would die. And that just doesn't seem right. So my, my plea is that we focus more on solutions than problems, and that we don't work against each other, we work together. Thank you very much.